Hello, and welcome to a casual reading of the OpenStax textbook, Microbiology. This is chapter one. This chapter is an introductory chapter to the subject of microbiology, and we begin with an invisible world. This chapter is divided into three sections, which talk about what our ancestors knew, a systematic approach to microbiology, and an introduction to types of microorganisms. Introduction. From boiling thermal hot springs to deep beneath the Antarctic ice, microorganisms can be found almost everywhere on Earth in great quantities. Microorganisms, or microbes as they are also called, are small organisms. Most are so small that they cannot be seen without a microscope. Most microorganisms are harmless to humans, and in fact, many are helpful. They play fundamental roles in ecosystems everywhere on Earth, forming the backbone of many food webs. People use them to make biofuels, medicines, and even foods. Without microbes, there would be no bread, cheese, or beer. Our bodies are filled with microbes, and our skin alone is home to trillions of them. Some of them we can't live without, others cause diseases that can make us sick or even kill us. Although much more is known today about microbial life than ever before, the vast majority of this invisible world remains unexplored. Microbiologists continue to identify new ways that microbes benefit and threaten humans. Section 1. What Our Ancestors Knew Learning Objectives Describe how our ancestors improved food with the use of invisible microbes. Describe how the causes of sickness and disease were explained in ancient times prior to the invention of the microscope. Describe key historical events associated with the birth of microbiology. Most people today, even those who know very little about microbiology, are familiar with the concept of microbes, or germs, and their role in human health. School children learn about bacteria, viruses, and other microorganisms, and many even view specimens under a microscope. But a few hundred years ago, before the invention of the microscope, the existence of many types of microbes was impossible to prove. By definition, microorganisms, or microbes, are very small organisms. Many types of microbes are too small to see without a microscope, although some parasites and fungi are visible to the naked eye. Humans have been living with, and using, microorganisms for much longer than they have been able to see them. Historical evidence suggests that humans have had some notion of microbial life since prehistoric times, and have used that knowledge to develop foods as well as prevent and treat disease. In this section, we will explore some of the historical applications of microbiology, as well as the early beginnings of microbiology as a science. Fermented Foods and Beverages People across the world have enjoyed fermented foods and beverages like beer, wine, bread, yogurt, cheese, and pickled vegetables for all of recorded history. Discoveries from several archaeological sites suggest that even prehistoric people took advantage of fermentation to preserve and enhance the taste of food. Archaeologists studying pottery jars from a Neolithic village in China found that people were making a fermented beverage from rice, honey, and fruit as early as 7000 BC or BCE. Production of these foods and beverages requires microbial fermentation a process that uses bacteria, mold, or yeast to convert sugars, carbohydrates, to alcohol, gases, and organic acids. While it is likely that people first learned about fermentation by accident, perhaps by drinking old milk that had curdled, or, a, or old grape juice that had fermented, they later learned to harness the power of fermentation to make products like bread, cheese, and wine. And here in this figure, we're looking at yeast. Now here, this is my own image. This was the last batch of beer that I brewed at home. It was a very good beer. Here is corn. 
ZMAs, as I'm sure you're familiar with, there is an agricultural product that we derive from corn that is intentionally infected with corn smut. In the United States, this is considered a pathogen, but in Mexico and South America, it is considered a treat. Here is the corn bearing tumors that are full of growing Eustilago matus or corn smut. This is called Huila Colche. This is the way you would see it in the marketplace, if you're outside the United States at least. This is how you can buy it here locally. This is one use. You can use Huila Colche directly with tortillas to have a tasty treat. Here is what I've made with it before. And if I make these again with the puff pastries, I'm going to use more spices. They were somewhat bland. Now the taste is somewhat between creamed corn and mushrooms. So if you like creamed corn and mushrooms, Huila Colche is definitely good to eat. Or definitely a tasty treat. Clinical focus, part one. Cora, a 41-year-old lawyer and mother of two, has recently been experiencing severe headaches, a high fever, and a stiff neck. Her husband, who has accompanied Cora to see a doctor, reports that Cora also seems confused at times and unusually drowsy. Based on these symptoms, the doctor suspects that Cora may have meningitis, a potentially life-threatening infection of the tissue that surrounds the brain and spinal cord. Meningitis has several potential causes, it can be brought on by bacteria, fungi, viruses, or even a reaction to medication or exposure to heavy metals. Although people with viral meningitis usually heal on their own, bacterial and fungal meningitis are quite serious and require treatment. Cora's doctor orders a lumbar puncture, a spinal tap, to take three samples of cerebrospinal fluid, CSF, from around the spinal cord, and that's illustrated in this picture here. The samples will be sent to laboratories in three different departments for testing, clinical chemistry, microbiology, and hematology. The samples will first be visually examined to determine whether the CSF is abnormally colored or cloudy. Then the CSF will be examined under a microscope to see if it contains a normal number of red and white blood cells and to check for any abnormal cell types. In the microbiology lab, the specimen will be centrifuged to concentrate any cells in a sediment. This sediment will be smeared on a slide and stained with a gram stain. Gram staining is a procedure used to differentiate between two types of bacteria, gram positive and gram negative. About 80% of patients with bacterial meningitis will show bacteria in their CSF with a gram stain. Cora's gram stain did not show any bacteria, but her doctor decides to prescribe her antibiotics just in case. Part of the CSF sample will be cultured, put in special dishes to see if bacteria or fungi will grow. It takes some time for most microorganisms to reproduce in sufficient quantities to be detected and analyzed. I'm going to go with, uh, in this example, the doctor prescribed antibiotics just in case it was indeed bacterial, just in case they missed it with the... Uh, Spinal tap with a CSF fluid examination. The Iceman treateth. Prehistoric humans had a very limited understanding of the causes of diseases, and various cultures developed different beliefs and explanations. While many believed that illness was punishment for angering the gods, or was simply the result of fate, archaeological evidence suggests that prehistoric people attempted to treat illnesses and infections. One example of this is Otzi the Iceman, a 5,300-year-old mummy found frozen in the ice of the Otzel Alps on the Austrian-Italian border in 1991. Because Otzi was so well preserved by the ice, researchers discovered that he was infected with the eggs of the parasite Trichurus trichura, which may have caused him to have abdominal pain and anemia. Researchers also found evidence of Borrelia burgdorferi, a bacterium that causes Lyme disease. Some researchers think Odsey may have been trying to treat his infections with the woody fruit of the Piptoporus batulinus fungus, which was discovered tied to his belongings. This fungus has both laxative and antibiotic properties. Odsey was also covered in tattoos 
that were made by cutting incisions into his skin, filling them with herbs, and then burning the herbs. There is speculation that this may have been another attempt to treat his health ailments. Now, before you think only ancient people that tried to employ treatments like this, consider the current trend called cupping. Here is an extreme result from having this treatment applied where this man's skin was actually burned severely and this is definitely a large infection risk and I couldn't find if he'd actually survived following this. You can't treat disease by putting suction cups on your skin. Sorry. Another bad idea in the modern time can be found by going to Goop, where they suggest putting rocks into vaginas. So yes, we are currently surrounded by lots of bad ideas. Early notions of disease, contagion, and containment. Several ancient civilizations appear to have had some understanding that disease could be transmitted by things they could not see. This is especially evident in historical attempts to contain the spread of disease. For example, the Bible refers to the practice of quarantining people with leprosy and other diseases, suggesting that people understood that diseases could be communicable. Ironically, while leprosy is communicable, it is also a disease that progresses slowly. That means that people were likely quarantined after they had already spread the disease to others. The ancient Greeks attributed the disease to bad air, malar, mal, aria. I'll, I'll put a little annotation up for that, which they called miasmatic odors. They developed hygiene practices that built on this idea. The Romans also believed in the miasma hypothesis and created a complex sanitation infrastructure to deal with sewage. In Rome, they built aqueducts, which brought fresh water into the city, and a giant sewer, the Cloaca Maxima, which carried waste away and into the river Tiber. Some researchers believe that this infrastructure helped protect the Romans from epidemics of waterborne illness. Even before the invention of the microscope, some doctors, philosophers, and scientists made great strides in understanding the invisible forces, which we now know as microbes, that can cause infection, disease, and death. The Greek physician Hippocrates, 460 to 370 BC, is considered the father of Western medicine. Unlike many of his ancestors and contemporaries, he dismissed the idea that disease was caused by supernatural forces. Instead, he posited that diseases had natural causes from within patients or their environments. Hippocrates and his heirs are believed to have written the Hippocratic Corpus, a collection of texts that make up some of the oldest surviving medical books. Hippocrates is also often credited as the author of the Hippocratic Oath, taken by new physicians to pledge their dedication to diagnosing and treating patients without causing harm. While Hippocrates is considered the father of Western medicine, the Greek philosopher and historian Thucydides, 460-395 BC, is considered the father of scientific history because he advocated for evidence-based analysis of cause and effect reasoning. Among his most important contributions are his observations regarding the Athenian plague that killed one-third of the population of Athens between 430 and 410 BC. Having survived the epidemic himself, Thucydides made the important observation that survivors did not get reinfected with the disease, even when taking care of actively sick people. This observation shows an early understanding of the concept of immunity. Marcus Terentius Varro, 116 to 27 BC, was a prolific Roman writer who was one of the first people to propose the concept that things we cannot see, which we now call microorganisms, can cause disease. In Res Rusticae, on farming, published in 36 BC, he said that precautions must also be taken in neighborhood swamps because certain minute creatures, Animalia minuta, 
grow there which cannot be seen by the eye, which float in the air and enter the body through the mouth and nose and there cause serious diseases. The Birth of Microbiology While the ancients may have suspected the existence of invisible, minute creatures, it wasn't until the invention of the microscope that their existence was definitively confirmed. While it is unclear who exactly invented the microscope, a Dutch cloth merchant named Antony van Leeuwenhoek, 1632-1723, was the first to develop a lens powerful enough to view microbes. In 1675, using a simple but powerful microscope, Leeuwenhoek was able to observe single-celled organisms, which he described as animalcules, or wee little beasties, swimming in a drop of rainwater. From his drawings of these little organisms, we now know he was looking at bacteria and protists. We will explore Leeuwenhoek's contributions to microscopy further in How We See the Invisible World, which is chapter 2. Nearly 200 years after Van Leeuwenhoek got his first glimpses of microbes, the golden age of microbiology spawned a host of new discoveries between 1857 and 1914. Two famous microbiologists, Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch, were especially active in advancing our understanding of the unseen world of microbes. Pasteur, a French chemist, showed that individual microbial strains had unique properties and demonstrated that fermentation is caused by microorganisms. He also invented pasteurization, a process used to kill microorganisms responsible for spoilage, and developed vaccines for the treatment of diseases, including rabies, in animals and humans. Koch, a German physician, was the first to demonstrate the connection between a single isolated microbe and a known human disease. For example, he discovered the bacteria that cause anthrax, bacillus anthracis, cholera, vibrio cholera, and tuberculosis, mycobacterium tuberculosis. We will discuss these famous microbiologists and others in later chapters. As microbiology has developed, it has allowed the broader discipline of biology to grow and flourish in previously unimagined ways. Much of what we know about human cells comes from our understanding of microbes, and many of the tools we use today to study cells and their genetics derive from work with microbes. Microconnections Microbiology Toolbox because individual microbes are generally too small to be seen with the naked eye, the science of microbiology is dependent on technology that can artificially enhance the capacity of our natural senses of perception. Early microbiologists like Pasteur and Koch had fewer tools at their disposal than are found in modern laboratories, making their discoveries and innovations much more impressive. Later chapters of this text will explore many applications of technology in depth, but for now, here is a brief overview of some of the fundamental tools of the microbiology lab. I will start with a figure that was in the textbook. Pictured here is the Petri dish, which is a flat-lidded dish that is typically 10 to 11 centimeters in diameter and 1 to 1.5 centimeters high. Petri dishes, made out of either plastic or glass, are used to hold growth media. And if you're from the UK, I believe you say it Petri dish. The other image here is that of an inoculation loop. An inoculation loop is a handheld tool that ends in a small wire loop. The loop can be used to streak microorganisms on auger in a Petri dish or to transfer them from one test tube to another. Before each use, the inoculation loop must be sterilized so cultures do not become contaminated. Microscopes produce magnified images of microorganisms, human cells and tissues, and many other types of specimens too small to be observed with the naked eye. Pictured here is the classic Olympus CH2 compound bright field light microscope. Common in microbiology labs, I expect many microbiology labs, though I've only worked in two teaching labs myself. Stains and dyes are used to add color to microbes so that they can be better observed under a microscope. 
Some dyes can be used on living microbes, whereas others require that the specimens be fixed with chemicals or heat before staining. Some stains only work on certain types of microbes because of the differences in their cellular chemical composition. Pictured here are the reagents employed in the gram stain, which will be discussed in great detail in the next chapter. Growth media are used to grow microorganisms in a lab setting. Some media are liquids, others are more solid or gel-like. A growth medium provides nutrients, including water, various salts, a source of carbon, like glucose, and a source of nitrogen and amino acids, like yeast extract. So microorganisms can grow and reproduce. Ingredients in a growth medium can be modified to grow unique types of microorganisms. Test tubes are cylindrical plastic or glass tubes with rounded bottoms and open tops. They can be used to grow microbes in broth or semi-solid or solid growth media. Pictured here is a just a nutrient broth. Test tubes will tend to be glass with loose fitting caps, those screw caps are an option, while petri dishes will tend to be plastic, at least in the microbiology teaching lab. A Bunsen burner is a metal apparatus that creates a flame that can be used to sterilize pieces of equipment. A rubber tube carries gas, which is the fuel, to the burner. In many ways, Bunsen burners are being phased out in favor of infrared micro incinerators, which serve a similar purpose without the safety risk of an open flame. While there are many more impressive examples of using microbes to make art on Petri dishes, this is my one little contribution from several years ago that I made for my wife. This is the Bacteria serratia morsesens growing on nutrient auger. Here is a, another way to grow microorganisms in order to distinguish differences. In this case, it is Pseudomonas on MGY auger under UV, in which case if the organism is Pseudomonas, it will fluoresce. If it is not Pseudomonas, it will not fluoresce. And that brings us to the end of Section 1 of Chapter 1. Join me next time for Section 2, A Systematic Approach. All right, until then.